Hey guys, Speculative Sandbox now has a shop. Treat yourself with graphic tees, tanks, stickers, and notebooks. Check out the podcast notes for a link, and don't forget to use the promo code SANDBOX to get 20% off. Thing When you're watching a movie, and it's clearly not taking place in our universe, even if it supposedly is, you know, on Earth, modern day, it's still clear this is a movie. So... If you don't make it clear to the viewer why we should care about this world ending, the one on the screen, then the threat won't mean anything. And I think a lot of times in storytelling, we take it for granted that they will, that the audience would care, because logically it, it, they should, but it just doesn't work that way. You have to, you have to build empathy for a world that's about to be destroyed, the same as you have to build empathy for you know, any individual character on your screen. Welcome to Speculative Sandbox, your audio playground for creative storytellers. My name is Vicki Lawn, and each episode, I and a guest will unpack a fiction trope with an eye for character development and narrative structures. Make sure to look for Speculative Sandbox on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter, where you can join the conversation. Leave comments or questions, or let us know what other tropes we should cover. When the real world just doesn't cut it, let's get lost in a fictional one. The end of the world is one of the most famous tropes used in movies and books. What makes our impending demise so alluring? And how is, even with the whole world at stake, some apocalyptic stories feel flat? I am so excited to welcome author Jason Pargin to the podcast. Known for the John Dies at the End and Zoe Ash book series, Jason talks about this trope's grip on society and helps to explain why our global demise alone may not actually be high enough stakes to make an audience feel truly invested. Okay, so Jason, full disclosure, I'm a huge fan of yours. I've been following your work ever since John Dies at the End came out. I actually read it as part of a at work book club. And um, me and my group attended a midnight showing of the movie when it first came back out in 2012. I've read your Zoe novels, and I'm really excited about your next book. If this book exists, you're in the wrong universe. So what's next for Dave, John and Amy? Um, well, I don't want to spoil anything in the book but i will say is it a spoiler to reveal that this is not the last book in the series they signed me to do a, a fifth one yay um, that's awesome but i guess that doesn't like everybody could still die at the end of this one that comes out and then the the fifth one could take place in the past or something you don't know oh yeah no it's i love fiction. that about anything your... can happen your first book was so funny to me, and that's uh, what I really enjoyed about your writing style and the humor that's layered in so many areas from the title of the book to just, I, I think I had mentioned, I'd written a comment on one of your old posts on social media a while ago where I said, you know, you start a sentence and I don't know how the sentence is going to end, which is really entertaining for me. And you've devastated me as a reader twice. I'll tell you this. Uh, the first one was Molly, and I know I'm not the only one who has probably told you that. And then in the what the hell did I just read the story that you shared about the whale and her baby and I believe dolphins. So you have this amazing ability to make the reader laugh out loud, but then to also like you hit them so hard with emotion. So can you talk a little bit about how you use humor and sadness and just like really balance these emotional emotional factors? I'm usually not great at explaining how I do it. One, because as uh, I don't like accepting any compliments people pay me. So like if somebody tells you, oh my gosh, you, you're so, you look so good today. What did you do? And your temptation is always like, I, well, just, I don't know. I just brushed my hair. I, I don't know. Um, because you don't want to get into like, well, you know, I, I obviously am an extremely beautiful human being. Part of it is genetics, but like, <laughs> I, I understand you can't. Uh, so it's the same thing, like even though I've been writing professionally for 20 some years, if somebody asked me, well, like, how did you how did you pull this off? And it's like, well, if I if I answer that, I'm agreeing with you that I pulled it off. And I'm just imagining some reader like going and getting the book from the library or buying a used copy of it. I was like, well, I don't think he pulled it off at all. Oh. This guy, this guy thinks he's so great. 
so we are for the purposes of this this is this is only aimed at the people who either enjoyed the books or are about to enjoy them and agree that they're that they're good that i don't i don't find it difficult to shift between humor and horror because i feel like a lot of us use humor to deal with horror mm -hmm. i feel like the last oh i don't know five six seven years of history have demonstrated that you can have something that is extremely funny happening but it's also terrible like the implications are just crushing but it's also kind of hilarious um and it's there's nothing unhealthy about that i don't think there's anything you know crass about admitting that some things are just you you laugh because what else can you do so these books are about characters who face the unknown and then part of for those who've not read them part of the joy of the books is supposed to be that the narrator has this extremely crass and depressed person's view of the world and he's not impressed by anybody any of it he's not amazed by any of it he mainly just wants to go back home and he's kind of so cynical that even some kind of an apocalyptic threat is just kind of like oh, okay so it's this like this again i knew it would be something like this and so there's this contrast between the wonder of what is happening and then his totally ill-fitting reaction to it um and you get humor from that but if it's done right and if i've done my job correctly you should care enough about these people that you still don't want to see them harmed and you don't want to see them lose so that's still there it's not the thing that some action movies do now that I don't like, where at every moment of tension, they have somebody do a joke or a glib or a remark to kind of, because they're almost afraid of the audience feeling too much tension. Mm -hmm. It's like every moment has to be light and delightful. So it's even when somebody is dying, they'll do a little joke as they're dying or even when, you know, and so there's, there's full of quips and that's kind of a Joss Whedon style of writing, which it's fine. A lot of people love it. Um, but for me, it diffuses a lot of the genuine tension. When I'm writing, I'm trying very, very hard with all of my meager writer powers to make sure that I'm not I'm not making life at the expense of, you know, the stakes of what's happening or that or that these are real people and that they're really feeling actual emotions. Right. Yeah, it's an interesting dichotomy when you compare humor to anything a little bit more somber. I think a lot about so I work in government and I have a lot of I oftentimes do PIO work with our police department and uh, first responders in general Northwest fire kind of stuff um, being able to like they see devastating things every day and they've developed a certain culture when you see them in a social hour where they're constantly joking and it's it's interesting because you're dealing with almost like a complete pendulum swing. So even though they might be complete opposite ends of the emotional spectrum, maybe it kind of makes sense if you're constantly one extreme that you're going to swing back over to the other and kind of create this interesting balance. It's just a coping mechanism. And I think if you see it out of context, you can say, oh, these people are callous. Like they don't, but you have to understand that, you know, it's same thing. You get the same sort of humor among emergency room doctors. Mm -hmm. like you know the first time you see a child mangled it devastates you and then the 10th time it probably devastates you and the 100th time it probably devastates you but 10,000 times in at some point you cannot ask yourself to feel that same level of emotion every time you don't have the capacity mm -hmm. so the humor that it or it comes off like the jokes are dehumanizing or you're making a joke at the expense of a corpse or a victim or whatever it is just something you're doing that allows yourself to continue functioning. And mm -hmm. I hope people do understand that, that it's the same thing, whether you're seeing it in a homicide detective or in like one of your bullies at school um, or any class clown. Usually if they're doing that, if they're asking for that kind of attention, it's usually because they're lacking somewhere else. It's usually because what they've got going on at home is very rough. And the humor, even if it's very mean spirited, even if the the jokes are are punching down or whatever, it is usually compensating for something they can't handle. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned earlier about your characters facing Armageddon type threats, and we're talking about 
end of the world tropes for our episode. When we emailed back and forth earlier, you immediately thought of talking about how different stories approach the end of world trope. So how do you define this trope in the first place? Well, I think when you're writing any kind of an epic thriller or drama or action movie or a, a comic book arc, you know, the first question when you're trying to sketch out your plot is, is like, what are the stakes? What's what's at stake here? What are they fighting for? And I think for a new writer, or, or at least this was the case for me when, when I was starting out, like you're thinking, well, the higher the stakes, the more exciting it's going to be for the audience. And what could be higher stakes than the end of the world, the, mm -hmm. the extinct, extinction of all human life? But I think that is kind of misunderstanding how audiences and storytelling work. And I think that a lot of blockbuster movies that you've watched and you've kind of left feeling nothing, I think it's a mistake they make. Uh, I think it's really easy to see stories, especially like these days, big blockbuster movies, where it was less exciting to have the stakes be the destruction of the world or of the universe or of the galaxy or however they phrase it, than it would have been if they had scaled it down and made it just about trying to save one person or mm -hmm. just about a smaller situation because if for reasons we'll we'll get into it's just that that's you would assume that the audience would immediately feel that as like extremely high stakes and the way storytelling works they really don't unless you handle it just right do you think when you maximize the scope to something worldwide it leaves out a lot of nuances like for example uh, we were talking about in the chosen one trope episode, what were you, what if you were chosen to save a community that you considered evil, you know, all the different nuances that are wrapped up in the world, it, it gets kind of brushed over because you're just kind of thinking about everything holistically. I'm thinking of like, I'm thinking of the blockbuster movies you're talking about too, which it almost feels kind of more flash and excitement. And maybe it's like a nice little escapism, but, you know, really thinking about what does it mean to save the full world? And do we have to think about, um, politics and you know all that stuff right but and, and there's nothing wrong with spectacle it, it, that that's that's a lot of why, why we go to movies i love it i love seeing big stuff happen on a screen it's just that i, I think there's there's spectacle that you watched and it stayed with you forever you know if you watch mm -hmm. the original lord of the rings trilogy a lot of people you know left just feeling the the weight of the whole story and then other times, you know, you can watch something that was equally big in scale that had just as many, just as big of battles and just as many people dying on the screen or whatever, and it just completely washed over you. And what I'm talking about is the difference between those two things, because when you say in a story like, uh, you know, it's the end of the world, the uh, the audience sitting there watching it or, or the, the reader reading it or whatever your medium is they know it's not their world at stake. It's a fictional world. You have to make it clear to them why it's bad that that world will be destroyed. And I know that's counterintuitive because it's like, well, that's ridiculous. Why why would you not be you know, devastated by that? But that's really not true. If If I told you that a planet on the other side of the galaxy exploded and that we think there was life on it, you would find that interesting for a while and then you would forget about it by lunchtime mm -hmm. because you don't have any connection to that. Well, it's kind of the same thing when you're watching a movie and it's clearly not taking place in our universe, even if it supposedly is, you know, on earth, modern day, it's still clear this is a movie. So if you don't make it clear to the viewer why we should care about this world ending, the one on the screen, then the threat won't mean anything. And I mm -hmm. think a lot of times in storytelling, we take it for granted that they will, that the audience would care because logically it, it, they should, but it just doesn't work that way. You have to, you have to build empathy for a world that's about to be destroyed the same as you have to build empathy for you know any individual character on your screen. They're assuming that we're, an extra in the story and therefore we would want to survive and therefore that alone would make us invested but you're, but to take that further and create put some work into actual stakes so that we as watchers can become actually invested there's a scene in independence day when the aliens are first blowing up all the stuff 
and uh, the woman and her dog are trying to escape into a tunnel where the flames are rolling down the street. Mm -hmm. And there's this extremely tense moment where you're waiting for the dog to jump away from the explosion and get to the safe little room they found. And it just barely makes it. And you're like, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in, behind the dog, the entire city of New York has been vaporized and everyone in it. So there's like 8 million dead people behind that dog. And the whole audience is like, yes, she, you know, she made it. The dog, the dog Fido made it into the safe room. I don't think we see the dog for the rest of the movie. But it, and I think that is a perfect example where we didn't care about any of those New Yorkers. We only cared about that dog because the way the scene was staged, mm -hmm. the way the dog is framed, the way the scene is shot, the movie is telling you None of those lives back there matter. Yeah. Do you think a dog is like the easy button or like a really tried and true method for getting people invested? It's. Yes, um, but it's not. I mean, it's it's not a bad shorthand. It's something I used. We've referenced it already used in the second book, but it was kind of making fun of the fact that nobody cared until something happened to this dog. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, and I, and I get it. I mean, it's, you know, a dog is innocent. It only wants to to love you or most dogs. Um, so you feel worse about it than if you see some person dying. Cause like, well, maybe that person was a jerk. We don't know. Mm -hmm. That guy, that guy could have been a, a child molester or something. Um, so it is, that's always been kind of easy shorthand or, or showing if you want to establish, you know, early on, I know there's a famous screenwriting book that it's like, if you want to make the audience care about a character early on, have them rescuing some kind of an animal. Mm -hmm. The Reacher series on Amazon did this where Jack Reacher, the first thing you see him do is like rescue a dog that's being mistreated. And it's like, ah, he's a good person. Or the opposite House of Cards where um, the main character, Frank, I'm forgetting his last name, like finds a dog that got hit by a car and just like puts it out of it like kills it and then you know right off the bat this is an evil character yeah uh, and then he looks right into the camera and talks about it for a while gosh i i i, I miss how much i miss that show obviously very good reason it went away i'm not saying mm -hmm. i hope hope they bring kevin spacey back but that was the early season of that show of him just hamming it up as the most villainous person doing that terrible accent Gosh, that was great cornball TV. Yes, it was. So why do you think, because the end of the world trope is so prevalent, why do you think it's become such a big part of modern culture? And I look back in like history too. I mean, you see this stuff used everywhere. You have the great floods in various mythologies. Um, you think about, I think about cults sometimes where the idea that something massive is coming and you have to like guard yourself about it so you can get lots of people fearful and then you can control them. Um, but what do you think about like the, Im the impression on culture? There doesn't seem to be a universal understanding of why, I don't know if it's, this is like more specifically these days, a Western culture type thing. Um, or if it's a, you know, the, like a, a Christian based culture where the end of the world, like you can use it as shorthand in a story because everybody knows what you mean when you say the end of the world, like the concept that the world has an end, like a story is something that is like, it's irrational. I, I mean, it, in theory, a, a meteor could come and destroy the planet, but that's extremely rare that that happens. And the odds of your life ending in a worldwide apocalypse are very slim because we've had many, many, many generations before you who lived and died without experiencing a worldwide apocalypse. They are rare events. But the only thing I can guess, and I am not an expert in any subject, uh, let alone this, is that over time, because there have been so many empires that have come and gone, that you think of people who lived in all of the, who lived in the aftermath of the Assyrian Empire or the Roman Empire or any of them that came and went. And they do you imagine like nomads living among those ruins mm -hmm. and telling stories about the the hubris of the people who once lived in the, this was a grand palace at one time and now it's just a weedy pasture that our goats are are living in. And then telling stories about 
like cautionary tales, you know, in your own life, if you, you don't become too power mad or don't become too whatever, or the gods will do this to you too. But I, I would just guess that those stories got handed down for generation after generation over thousands of years to where it's just woven into the culture that empires fail, worlds die. And because of our, like we love stories we love storytelling as a format like we always try to understand the world in the form of a story we want good guys and bad guys and we want to think in terms of things having like a beginning middle and an end mm -hmm. so we have the superstition and it is a superstition that one day civilization has to end like a like a movie like it has to stop that the idea that it can just peter on for thousands of years in different forms as, as it has been it's kind of people really struggle to wrap their heads around that Mm -hmm. So you have this cultural belief in not just that empires collapse, but that um, that it's inevitable that they collapse and then it, that it's inevitable that humans will go extinct for whatever reason that's already woven into the culture. And then pop culture, because pop culture is just mostly mirrors what we're already telling each other. It's a real easy shorthand that anybody, you know, if we don't if we don't stop this virus from getting out, it could be the end of the world. And that that phrase, the end of the world, everybody immediately knows what that is. It might, so I get why we use it as shorthand, but it's just that I think my issue is that it's it's not enough on its own. I think sometimes about babies that build their towers and knock them down. Do you think there's some aspect to crafting an end of the world story that has to do with like, let's see what happens when we destroy everything that we've created or even a, now I've destroyed everything I didn't like about this world and I can rebuild, there's potential to rebuild it in my own image or what I think is better. Maybe, but there, I think we're starting to get into the, like the, the post-apocalypse genre. Mm -hmm. Which I think is a little bit of a different thing because in Hollywood, what's happened is the post-apocalypse movies or TV shows, they're just taking their old Westerns and re retelling them in, in a post-apocalypse because you always assume the post-apocalypse operates under the same rules, that it's sparsely populated. There's some sort of population of warlike tribes or natives or zombies or robots or something out there that's a lingering threat. But that it's a world that doesn't have, uh, it's not a world of jobs and memos and dress codes and cubicles. It's it's a world because that's where, that's what's attractive about post-apocalypse. Because like imagine all of the stress of your life, no more bills, no more having to go to weddings or having to travel for work, all that stuff, all that pressure is lifted. It's life is simpler. It's just you and your band of survivors in a you know in a, a wide open area with uh getting going on adventures and it makes a great palette to tell stories on but the people who genuinely like kind of are rooting for that uh, probably should talk to someone about it <laughs> because obviously <laughs> in real life the thing that will kill you in that apocalypse is not the zombies it's diarrhea because mm -hmm. you're not going to be able to get clean water I was just or thinking that <laughs> like you get rid of all of your stresses, but now you got to find your water source. Right. And I get it. I get that the world, the modern world is so this, the anxiety you get from having so overloaded with tasks because the world is so specialized now. And there's so many of us, and we live in such close proximity. I can see that wanting to make, wanting to make that go away and the, all the preppers out there, the people out there who, who are gathering, you know, like collecting supplies and building a bunker and a bomb shelter. In most cases, they're not just doing it as a precaution. It's like, well, you never know. They're actively rooting for it. Like that you see them go on Twitter and like celebrate every time somebody mentions nuclear war because it's mm -hmm. like this will be the chance to say I told you so. And they're imagining a post-apocalypse where they're living like a king because they stockpiled all of this toilet paper and canned goods and the rest of us idiots are all starving in the wasteland. Um, and that is a fantasy. And it, it's something that they seem to want. And we we definitely can't, a, a movie can't show post-apocalypse without making it look like fun. Yeah. Um, it just can't help it. Like we want to be Daryl in The Walking Dead. Like he's he's super badass. We all imagine ourselves being him. When in reality, like I would be the first one dead if, if this, I have no skills.
What would so then go, segueing into the next question, the flaws and challenges associated with that trope. You're talking about fantasizing the end of the world, but really the real circumstances are a lot more dire. So for someone who wants to start writing this trope, what are some flaws and challenges that you think would naturally come up in these circumstances? The the key thing is when you're sitting down to think about stakes. You and again, to be clear, we're not this is not gonna be a thing where we're telling people this trope needs to die or you need to stop using it. You can do whatever you want. I that's the kind of writer advice I hate the most. But for the people watching this, like who don't aspire to write or listening to this who don't aspire to, to write, this is what we're talking about to talk about. Any action movie you've ever seen, any thriller that's kind of left you feeling hollow, this is why. And I the reason is that when you're trying to figure out how to bring home stakes to a viewer or to a listener, to a reader, it's not about scale. It's about just building empathy for the characters. If you care enough about the characters, then any bad thing that happens to them will feel apocalyptic. You can write a story that's absolutely devastating that's uh, about a child who's lost their hat mm -hmm. because you have built up what that hat means. You have built up the, the child's emotional state and where they are in their life. Like you, you have brought home in clear detail what this character wants, what they want their life to be and what they're getting instead. And then why this matters to them. I mean, they're like one of the most devastating pieces of film on the internet is this video of a raccoon who's trying to eat some cotton candy and it puts it in water to try to wash it off. Mm -hmm. And then it dissolves and it's just like emotionally crushed because it, it can't figure out where it went. Yeah. Um, just in the, con like, that's a perfect, a perfect little story. Cause it, from the beginning, you can see how happy it is to have the coffin candy, the, the cotton candy. And then you can see the steps it goes through and you feel terrible for it. And you're like, well, somebody, is there a part two where they, somebody gave it more? Um, that's a great example of where the stakes objectively are nothing, but a story told well enough, you can draw the the audience into it. So when you're talking about making the stakes measurable or making them high or making them felt, it's all about making the character's emotional state very, very clear and making their wants and their desires very clear. If you're a new writer or if you're just, if you really focused on something that's kind of action, kind of thriller, kind of whatever, it's very easy to write characters that are just kind of uh, glib or wisecracking or whatever. Mm -hmm. But the audience won't feel the same thing if you've not, you know, tried to imbue some sort of, not just humanity in this person, but kind of made it really clear what the consequences are for them because i'm telling you when you're watching like a mission impossible movie um and you see that you know that, that ethan hunt tom cruise's character he diffuses a bomb it, there's one second left on the bomb and it's it's a nuclear bomb that's going to blow up the whole world or, or whatever the audience was holding their breath not because they were afraid the bomb would blow up the city but because they were afraid it would blow up the ethan hunt mm-hmm Tom Cruise that they're 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 happy that he got away from the bomb not this abstract thing of well if this bomb goes off it's going to detonate it's going to destroy Moscow and that's going to trigger a nuclear war that stuff is all just abstract it kind of doesn't mean anything we care about the people we can see and the people we've been mm -hmm. watching how do you see that reflected in real life? We talk about Ethan Hunt, you talk about the dog, but meanwhile, we're not, as you said, not worried about the rest of the people in the city. We're not worried about the rest of the people in tunnel. So how does that tunnel vision apply to real, real life? I think that's just human nature because if you, and no one will say this out loud, but if you had a choice if somebody came to you and said, Hey, your beloved dog, um, we need to kill your dog to save the life of a random child in on the other side of the planet. Pick pick a country. Mm -hmm. uh, it's somewhere in Russia, in, in Siberia, there's, there's a child. A lot of people would have difficulty 
letting that happen mm -hmm. because it would be like, well, that's not my child or that's surely there's got to be some other way to do it. Like you would not openly say, no, the, the dog that lives in my house every day means more to me than this total stranger's life on the other side of the planet. But that literally ab absolutely is true. If you hook them up to a lie detector machine and said, whose life do you value more? It's obviously the, the dogs. Mm -hmm. um, and part of a modern world where we're living in a, world where there's just more human beings and what we can keep track of everybody who does any kind of uh, propaganda anything like that the first thing they do is they recognize that it's not going to mean anything if we simply tell you oh ukraine could get taken over because most of us a lot of us can't point to ukraine on the map mm -hmm. but if you send around these viral videos of women and children being driven from their homes by the Russians or of wounded or, or dead children and women and dogs and of, you know, friendly, you know, amiable uh, soldiers on, on the Ukrainian side, like that's the stuff that hits home because it's not now not this abstract concept of a map and a piece of land and a government that's being ruled by this country or this one. Um it, you know, it, it's it's now bringing home like these are the good human beings. Those are the bad human beings. Only like, here are their faces, their voices. You're you're actually seeing them. But at every step, you have to kind of cut through the noise because we don't have the brain power to conceptualize that many people. If I sat down and asked you to write out on with a ink pen the names of every person whose name you know, you're not going to write down ten thousand names. Mm -hmm. It's going to be several dozen or a couple hundred. It's you know it depends on how personable you are, um, but that's that's kind of the challenge of modern life because every political issue, every decision that's being made um, when you vote, every side trying to convince you one way or the other, they're having to cut through this exact same thing where it's too abstract to say, well, you know, changing this law or 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 funding this program will save eight hundred lives a year. But if you have one single famous example of a child or some sort of innocent person getting injured by this thing they want to ban, that, that will do it. Now you've got a face and a name you can attach to it. And this is why in a lot of cases people knew as an abstract matter, for example, that the police shoot a lot of people in America and that a lot of those shootings are kind of questionable and there's mm -hmm. not a lot of good record keeping. And that was an issue that's been around for as long as police have been around. But until somebody invented a camera that could show it happening to an individual, only then did it flip the switch. Because it's like, oh, here is a sympathetic person this happened to rather than a statistic. Mm -hmm. So going into possibly controversial territory, the pandemic, when it comes to like, and I still see people today fighting on the street about whether someone should or should not wear a mask and the idea of empathy and what could have been done differently, knowing storytelling tricks, at least, and humanizing people and getting people invested in, in the stakes. Um, what were your thoughts on that entire rollout and, you know, public relations messaging could have been done better or is there something really that could have been done? Oh, Lord, this is a minefield. I know, because I'm sorry. I, I will go to my grave believing that part of the, the difficulty in responding to the pandemic is we could not take cameras into the hospitals mm. and show the rows of people on ventilators. And in the early days when they they were having to use refrigerator trucks to handle all the corpses, things like that, um, it, it was, you, they, you could, for privacy reasons, you couldn't show it. You couldn't show that on the news. So what you got was an endless avalanche of just numbers um, and statistics and humans just don't process numbers. We just don't. It doesn't. It just doesn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. If you told me cigarettes killed two million people last year, I'd say, "Wow, that's a lot." So, if you told me, "Well, actually, you know what? That was wrong. They killed four million people last year," I don't suddenly feel twice as bad because two million, four million are just numbers. I'm not. I'm not picturing two million faces and lives in my head. It's just a number on a screen. Mm -hmm. So it's the same thing when the only way they were able to cover it was to show all these numbers, number of infected is spiking, the number of dead is spiking, number of hospitalizations are, are, are we're at 98% capacity in New York. It just didn't mean anything because in terms of being able to show someone in a bed, like gasping for breath, 
you know, on a ventilator and terrified and the family can't go see them because they're just not being able to show it for the same reason that before we could show live combat footage, our attitude toward war was completely different mm. until mm -hmm. we saw it. Like there was one photo in Vietnam of a naked child running down the street on fire mm -hmm. that changed the world because like, oh, this is not just a number. This is not just a map that changed from one color to another. This is a living child, just like the one I have, just like the one next door. And so that was with COVID. I, I think that early on, it was hard to convey how horrible it was. And then obviously the separate thing with it becoming so politicized, that's a whole separate deal. But I think as politics aside, because so much of the infected were separated from us and you had things like individual outbreaks in meatpacking plants or among certain populations that are just not visible to us, it's just too easy to ignore it, no matter how many numbers you throw at us. Mm -hmm. It was just hard to put a human face on it, whereas the inconvenience, like the empty shelves, things like that, well, that hit home because that's right in front of me. And unfortunately, right. it's just the way humans work. It's the way I work too. I, this isn't even a criticism. We are flawed. We are flawed creatures. Um, but it's you know you you could sit, tell me the same thing. The, the like the computer I'm using, my phone, it's using rare earth minerals that may have been mined in some country where they're using child slaves to mine the minerals, and I wouldn't even know about it because mm -hmm. I just assume well well that's not what am I supposed to do about that? Right. So jumping back into the fictional world, then knowing you know what it takes to have to get people interested in in real world and fictional because i love how it crosses over right fiction is just a reflection of what happens in the real world what are some examples who did it right the movies the books that you love that just pulled it off for example like the the lord of the rings trilogy when people read those books for the first time i think a lot of them are shocked by how long you spend in the shire at bilbo's birthday party mm -hmm. It takes them a long time to hit the road in that book, but you know, but it's crucial. It's crucial because it's not if you just did the standard thing that a lot of like the lesser, the not as good movies, you know, and the writers who don't happen to be all time geniuses like Tolkien. Well, they figured, well, we've got a bad guy who wears black and his his palace is black and it's got fire coming out of it. Like all of those things signal evil. Surely if we just say, well, you know, if uh, we don't stop this guy, then the fiery person wearing, you know, an obsidian mask and a big black tower shaped like a skull, clearly the audience will know it's bad if that guy takes over the world. But what Tolkien does is he, at great length, describes to you why you don't want to see this world be tainted, mm -hmm. really emphasizing this pastoral lifestyle of the hobbits, the, the simple people, farming people, they like, you know, green things and just the things that Tolkien himself loved, you know, meadows and, and animals and, and gardening and stuff like that really driving home what will be lost if this world ends mm -hmm. um, and really raising the stakes in a way that, again, if you didn't know any better, you would think that that's not necessary. Well, of course we know it's a bad thing. It's like, no, you intellectually know it's a bad thing. He is trying to emotionally make you know it's a bad thing. That when you later on, when you see or you read about Saruman, you know, ripping down the trees and firing up these furnaces to to turn it into one giant factory that makes you know makes swords and and armor for his armies. You feel that in your gut because you're not just watching a process, you're not just watching industry, you're not just thinking about oh he's going to gain a technical advantage because of all these great metal swords he's making. You feel the loss of the trees you feel the loss of the forest you mm -hmm. feel it this these as a living thing that is being ripped apart and desecrated by this person's ambition and by these these fires and the violence and, and all of that so i think without that beginning part without that groundwork being done to remind the reader the viewer the audience why they care about this and why they don't want to see this world 
burned or or torn down or whatever it just doesn't hit the same that later on when you all of these scenes that make you excited and have you on the edge of your seat you're only on the edge of your seat because of that boring stuff that happened earlier mm-hmm. but because you saw the way the hobbits celebrate a birthday because you fell in love with them and the way they live their lives and their lifestyle and then the hobbits represent kind of what's the best of middle earth mm-hmm. it's like the the best case scenario for what the civilization would be and then, you know, and as they go, you encounter the men and the dwarves and all of that. Um, but it starts with the hobbits, and that's and and that's that's precisely why. Um, but I think it's kind of I think, you know, um the the choice, the the movie Titanic, like choosing to tell that as a love story, that probably brought home the tragedy of the sinking more than if it had just been a movie about the boat sinking, if it had mm-hmm. just been following the crew or the professionals trying to keep it afloat, because it, even though it sounds, it, it sounds silly, it, it, logically it's nonsense. Cause it's like, th- why, why do I care about these two teenage people, teenage, teenagers have known each other for one day right, yeah. and they had a crush on each other when, you know, a thousand people are dying or I don't remember how many people died in the Titanic, but it was a lot. It's like, why does their brief crush matter more than all of these people who died? But it does. Mm-hmm. The way humans work, it does. And so by, by zooming in on these two attractive people and seeing that when he died and when this happened that there was a future that was snuffed out it's a way of conveying okay take that times a thousand and it's true that when the boat is sinking and all of these people are in the water screaming you're only thinking but how is jack going to get out of this there's yeah. not room for him on the door yeah <laughs> and and again logically mathematically that is insane like don't those people deserve to live just as much Aren't their lives just as, but the way storytelling works, the way film works, books work, anything. If you want the audience to feel it saying, well, there was a thousand, you know, 1200 people went in the water off that ship. That won't mean anything. It would mean something to a robot. It wouldn't mean anything to a human. Numbers don't, don't do it for us. And seeing crowds of people die in a CGI explosion does nothing. It just doesn't affect us. So spending three long hours making you dearly love these two people and, mm-hmm. and seeing her struggle with, you know, not fitting into her society and seeing Jack and his rebellious attitude and throwing off like it, you've got all the stuff bound up with, you know, the economic inequality mm-hmm. and, and sexism and patriarchy. Like that's all there in the story, all this stuff in them, all the stuff that they know it's doomed. They're not going to be able to, to overcome this. But he's like, we've got to try, you know, love is all that matters. It is something that you could show that movie anywhere in the world and it would make, it would hit home. And then, so now that you care about these two and if the boat goes down, it takes them with it. Now you care about the boat going down. Right. And An I extreme think example. Is, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, no, go ahead. I would say extreme example of what you're talking about where there's so many people dying and we're only caring about the main characters, and this is comical, but like Power Rangers, whenever they shove a robot over a building and crush things, there's hundreds of people dying in those buildings, but you don't care. You're just thinking, and from a very young age, watching the Power Rangers, and you're like, yeah, my Power Rangers won. Never mind the city is a complete and total mess. Yeah, and in the era of like CGI building destruction, that's just nonstop. Like you'll see Batman and Superman now, especially in the Zack Snyder movies, like they're fighting each other and entire buildings are falling over mm-hmm. in the course of the battle. And it's like, well, now hold on. Why did, or an even funnier example is where there's a movie trying to do a little bit more of moral nuance. And so the hero fights their way through 200 henchmen to get to the villain, mm. but then doesn't kill the main villain because it's like, no, I'm going to give you, um, uh, you're going to stand trial. I'm going to give you a chance to redeem yourself because it's like, well, now, but what about all of those goons you killed to get to his palace to like to get to his headquarters? You know, didn't yeah. they, did, didn't they deserve a second chance? It's like, well, no, because movies always do this. They establish through how they're shot, edited, written, these lives matter, these lives don't. And so you can watch a movie like the, the Roland Emmerich films are funniest about this because 
literally the entire planet is being destroyed. But you've got one family, and so you're rooting for, uh, I can't remember, was it John Cusack, whoever was, was the main guy in 2012? Like you're rooting for his limousine to make it out of Los Angeles, but all of Los Angeles has fallen into the lava. And yeah. again, I don't know how many people that is. It's like, it's like 10 million plus people if you include all the surrounding areas. But it's mm -hmm. like, no, but thank God he got to the airport and got to fly away. And then you're watching the, like the entire earth is, is being swallowed up. And it's like, okay, so am I, like, is there, a, and I understand that in the language of center, it's like, no, you only care if if this guy and his family makes it out. Um, and those are like the most extreme, it, they would almost be parodies if, if I thought he was that self-aware because it's almost like, what does it matter that this guy made it out? <laughs> He's living on a ruined planet. Uh, but yeah. Do we just love mass destruction? It's definitely fun, but mm -hmm. that's something that's primal. I, I don't, I mean, if you're a, a child, I mean, if you've never gotten to break glass before, there is something wonderful about breaking glass. It, it's, it's, you know, if you're not the one who has to repair it. But mm -hmm. if you've ever been a child, like like when I in my youth, I was in the era when they would let you just just go play in the junkyard if you wanted to. Yeah, you know, like smashing the the glass out of the out of an old car window is an amazing feeling. I actually don't know why, from an evolutionary point of view or from a psych psychological point, I don't know why destruction is so satisfying. But I guess it's just an outlet for. I don't know. I guess, I guess it's the, you're feeling like you've made a mark on the world because the world, when you're you know young, it seems so immovable and like you don't have the ability to, to change it in any way. So the ability to just break something and now it's broken. It's like I did that. It's like the first thing you can really accomplish. And so I think you grow up seeing a beautiful building and thinking that is a big beautiful building. I would love to like knock it over like like if i like, like if i if somebody there's a thing where you could win the lottery and part of the prize was you get a wrecking ball to smash over any building you wanted what well, empty it out first uh it's like most of us would take that would take mm -hmm. that chance because that would be amazing to just just smash a building i know that there's like um places you can go where you can put on like safety goggles and get a sledgehammer and they let you just smash stuff you pay a fee and it's like mm -hmm. a little playroom for adults to who've always wanted to just just wreck something um, but it's weird because in the CGI era, the cheap CGI era, mm -hmm. I think they do bigger destruction than ever before. It's easier than ever to have a bunch of uh, glass buildings tumbling over, but it hits home less than before. Like I, I think I felt more when some of the cardboard towers in Godzilla were being knocked over. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Cause it feels it. tangible maybe. I don't know because it, like in the Transformers movies, you know, when the robots and they come, they'll climb up through the glass and he's got, they're all using, it seems like the same CGI software because the glass always breaks and falls in like the exact same way. And it's just got this very distinct, and it's like so beautiful to look at the, the breaking of the glass and the toppling of the tower. There's no feeling of dread or loss or anything it, compared to that one tree getting ripped down and lord of the rings and they throw it down into the furnace mm -hmm. like that one tree hit me harder than seeing an entire skyscraper fall over in transformers at three um and it is just spectacle but it, it doesn't it, for me it doesn't even serve the purpose of spectacle it doesn't i don't feel amazed uh watching that because again spectacle it shouldn't just be big stuff happening but big stuff that's that means something that, that's, that's tangible to you so I have some questions for you from listeners, but first I wanted to make sure we covered everything you wanted to cover. Well, I, I think that probably, I, I don't think I've mentioned it yet, but the one movie that I thought was kind of ruined by making the end of the world, it's MacGuffin or it was uh, Tenet. Oh, I, okay. Which first is, of all, I regrettably could not understand a lot of it. <laughs> so <laughs> tell me, I, yeah, tell me your thought on it. Well, I think the people who love it love the technical aspects of the filmmaking. They love the soundtrack. It looks great. And then the cleverness of the idea and the staging of the action and the the, the car mm -hmm. chase where half of them are going backward through time and the other half are going forward. That is incredible. Mm -hmm. At no point in the course of that chase did I understand what would happen if they didn't do the thing 
versus what would happen if they did do ah, the thing. Gotcha. Because the motives. Because at some point they made it so that it was kind of a mystery box story, and then there's a big twist uh, that you. Anyone watching, I hope we would guess the twist that it's like, oh, there's going to be time travel shenanigans that it means that somebody was going backward when you thought they were going forward. Um, but it's too it's so busy being clever that throughout the story, like there's an entire subplot where the goal is to try to retrieve this painting mm -hmm. because of this, it's being used as leverage in a divorce. And it's like, but what, what are we... And then ultimately to the finale is based around they've come up with a MacGuffin and there's multiple parts of it they have to put together. And it's a time travel bomb that they've sent from the future into the past to destroy the past. Mm. And so it becomes this, they have to do this crazy time heist on a battlefield to prevent this really abstract time deletion thing that you just don't, or I just didn't feel. Whereas if the whole story had been based around like trying to save one life, let, like let's say there's one child they were trying to save because the child was going to grow up to be a, an important Senator and whatever. And then all of the time shenanigans are only based around saving this child. And then it, it's, you've got carrying that through as a through line through the story. I think it would have hit me much, much harder scales are much lower and you could even say something like well you know this person this child's going to pass an important piece of legislation in the future and, and powerful interests don't want that to happen or whatever that's fine but in terms of having like an actual face you can care about and a human you could care about and you get to know that person or get to know the kid or get to know whoever is being rescued and care deeply about them as a human being and want to see them survive, that would have hit me 10 times harder than whatever was going on at the end, mm. which again, had all sorts of spectacle. You had reverse explosions and people getting sucked into backward explosions and, and trapped inside walls due to reverse time ammunition, stuff like that. Super cool. But while I was watching that, at no point was it clear if, this guy doesn't get exploded what happens or what are the what are the consequences of him getting exploded it's just a bunch of cool stuff happening and so there i think trying to make the stakes the end of the world or the the, the all the entire universe will be erased or something whatever it was it just didn't you might as well have said nothing like mm -hmm. it, it just doesn't hit home because none of these characters were drawn out well enough that you cared about them and again that was partly due to to have the twists work, you needed characters to not reveal too much about themselves or the personalities, but that really undermined the movie. Would you say it was more gimmick driven and that's why like it lost the audience? Maybe, but I don't, I don't care about gimmicks. I love gimmicks. I I'm, I'm fine with a good old fashioned gimmick. It's just that you have to, if people watch movies to watch other human beings do interesting stuff mm -hmm. uh, it, but it does have to be other human beings and even if your movie is as the lion king those are human beings there they talk yeah. like people they act like people they act there so um all the other stuff is extra and if you don't have the human part of it none of the rest is going to matter it just it just won't you you'll appeal to some people who are just very bored and they want to spend a couple of hours watching watching st some stuff explode but in terms of a, a story that people will actually remember it's entirely about your ability to make them care about the humans it is that is the only reason they picked up your book it's the only reason they they picked up your movie or, or went to the theater and watch it is to watch human beings do stuff they didn't watch the new top gun movie to watch planes fly around they watched it to watch tom cruise fly planes around mm -hmm. All right. Ready for question, uh, questions from listeners? Sure. Okay. So I posted on my Instagram to all my followers that I'm going to be interviewing Jason Pargin and what questions do you have? And so they sent me a good, a good number. And so I'm just going to do a quick rapid fire with you if you're ready. All right. All right. What is the nature and origin of the sauce? Well, we don't know. It's, and I think this is for those who don't aren't familiar with my books, uh, the books I wrote that made me a professional writer. I'm not saying about as bad as they made me famous as a writer. Obviously, if I'm having to explain it to you, I'm not very famous. 
But <laughs> I, I, I am here today as an, as an author because I wrote a book called John Dies at the End that became a movie called John Dies at the End and became a cult favorite and launched a career as a uh, full-time novelist these days. And the premise is that the characters who are a couple of small town losers from like this economically depressed area, they get hold of a, what they think is a drug, this this thick black liquid that kind of moves on its own and they take it. And it basically does what they think is like an acid trip, but it's, they're not seeing hallucina hallucinations. They're seen through like time and space. And mm -hmm. so it lets you slip out of reality and suddenly you realize, you know, everything about like multiple universes and things that are watching you that you just can't see them. Now you can see them and it totally changes the nature of their reality. So it's kind of, it serves a purpose in the story, um, but it doesn't, I never explain exactly where it came from. And it's kind of clear that the people in the story don't know where it came from because there's a hint that the, the sauce is an entity of its own. It's a living thing. Um, but, and then what it does is very unpredictable because the whole deal is that you're ingesting something that's like from another dimension or that exists in multiple dimensions and now you have it in your veins. Mm -hmm. um, but this is a case where, I think you have to be okay with leaving things unexplained for the readers because the entire horror of the situation in my books is that these characters are dealing with something and they're not experts and they're not authorities on the matter. And as they turn to various people who they think are experts for help, there's really not very much help to be had. And so that bring, because we've all, I think, felt like that at some point in our lives, like these guys are in their early 20s. I think everyone who has been ejected from college out into the adult world and realized they have not been prepared for any of it. Mm -hmm. And you find yourself in this world where there are all these rules that don't make sense and all these forces that you're totally at their mercy. Um, and you can't, you you feel like you're alone. You feel like you can't get get help from anybody. So here- this the sauce is kind of their introduction to a world that's even bigger and scarier than what they thought but the fear they feel is very similar to the fear a lot of us feel entering adulthood because it is the fear of the unknown one thing with a lot of horror movies where the premise is like a lot of haunted house movies are like this where it's like weird stuff happening at the house we learn the history of the house eventually the monster which is usually just an old wet old woman for some reason mm -hmm. uh, emerges and we find a way to defeat her we now understand where she came from we figured out how to beat her and she's gone my books i never wanted to give you that simple formula of monster comes along we learn what it is we learn its weaknesses then we kill it because to me that's too too pat i i, I think having a, an ongoing story where the more you find out the weirder it gets and so you just have to make your way through that to me is more true to the way life works mm -hmm. and so the sauce is a case where they know if they ingest it certain things are going to happen but they are not in control of it and also it's not totally predictable it's like man that is that is life at age 23 in a nutshell mm -hmm. because you're forced to do things to get by and you don't know the outcome and you're so much on your own um so no to me like ever explaining it or going back and doing a prequel explaining the origins of things to me that ruins it i i hate prequels in hollywood i hate it mm -hmm. because if you have the original story that left certain backstory or certain history unspoken. And it's like, well, let's make a movie that explains exactly where, you know, that, that it shows exactly where Freddy Krueger came from or how Michael Myers got like this. It's like, no, Michael Myers is scary because there is no reason for this person to exist like this. Mm -hmm. it, 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 there's no reason. But then you, you have all these movies. It's like, well, actually it, he was part of a ritual and imbued him with an evil spirit. It's like, no, you've made you've made the story more boring by explaining oh, no. it. Yep, over explaining. 
A lot of authors seem to have a lot of trouble completing book sequels within a reasonable time frame. This is the question that someone asked. What are the challenges of writing multiple sequels, especially after your story gains a loyal following? And how have you managed to over overcome those challenges? Well, there's a very big difference, one thing, between a series that's episodic like mine, where you, if you read just book three, you're fine. It's it, it introduces you to the concept. It's a complete story. It ends. Mm -hmm. If I was trying to write an ongoing, you know, like, like a fan, like some fantasy series or like a song of ice and fire where, you know, a book will literally end on kind of a cliffhanger and, and the audience is waiting for the next one. I would actually struggle mightily with that. Like I'm helped by the fact that each new book is starting from scratch to the point that I kind of don't care if the the details don't line up particularly or if they don't have the exact same tone because it's like no this is a new book it takes place a few years later the characters are a little bit older and it's it's its own thing it's going to start off it's going to introduce the whole world the whole rules of the world and then it's going to at the end it I, I that is my promise to you at the end it will end like it will come to a conclusion and the next book will be about something else mm -hmm. it's not going to be Oh my gosh, will they survive by book five to find out? Um, if if I did have to do that, I would struggle with it because I think a lot of authors, especially when you have an ongoing series, you get bogged down because especially in the internet age, when all of your fans are out there speculating about what happens. And if they've all, as has happened with, I think the Song of Ice and Fire books where the fans easily guessed the twist with Jon Snow, which has not still not been revealed in the books, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but they've put it together. It's like, that's hard to write a story when the audience already knows what, what happens because they've guessed it and you can't escape it. Like George R. R. Martin knows what fans are talking about. Cause I've seen him address it. I think that is extremely difficult. If you do, if you, if you are trying to give them the next chunk of the saga in the era, when fans are just talking to each other constantly 24 hours a day, and they're ahead of you to the point that they're now acting like they'll be disappointed mm, yeah. if your twist is just the one that you had set up. So now you're trying to think, like, I remember the writers of, of Westworld actually doing this, actually getting like scrapping twists because it's like, no, the fans on Reddit have already guessed it. But it's like, no, Reddit, that's like one half of 1% of your audience. Mm -hmm. Write your story, right? Write the story that's consistent with the themes you set up, you know, right? follow through with the twist that you had in mind. But I think these days writers kind of psych themselves out. Whereas for me, these could easily be novels set in, like I could repurpose these as just individual standalone books with different characters um, that are just kind of similar. And it would still, I could still make it work mm -hmm. um, because they are each, they're each their own thing. So that, that to me makes it is what makes it easier. Cause I'm not thinking in, in terms of, Oh my gosh, how do I follow up? that last book with this one it, it, that's not that's not how it works because they're so different and i'm not trying to do the hollywood sequel thing where it's like okay we've got double the budget it's got to be bigger instead of two villains we've got to have four we've mm -hmm. got to have mm -hmm. venom and sandman and it's like no it, i i'm not i'm not thinking how to keep getting bigger and keep topping myself these are books you can you can come in and book five can be a small intimate little affair and that's just fine for the interest of time, since we're coming up on an hour and I don't want to take up too much of your time, what genres would you prefer if video games were created based on the John Dies at the End or Zoe Ash series? I don't know because I think it is extremely difficult to con to adapt most stories to video games because the way video games work now their game mechanics are almost entirely based around combat. Okay. And you look at any game adaptation, it's, um, you know, the, the primary way by which you move through the levels is by killing lots of creatures and killing lots of enemies. And that's just killing us. Because of the way games have evolved, the way the controls and the game engines have evolved, we've somehow have landed on that, where even if it's, you know, a platformer type game, it's, still populated with enemies you have to i mean even mario has to kill the little mushroom people mm -hmm. because the concept of there's this this moving thing in your way in order to get around it you have to kill it um so to take any like any kind of 
decent, even like an action based um, book or, or series and try to make a game out of it. It's difficult because you have to, if you don't want it to be continuous combat, and I wouldn't because that's not what the books are about. Like where there is action and violence in the books, it's never as simple as these are monsters we have to kill with like a chainsaw or a shotgun or something that then actually in these books that that never works it never succeeds for them they always have to find some weirder more clever way to to get around it so you would i would want to say well it's got to be kind of like uh you know it's got to be a story-based thing it has to be something that leans heavily into the humor element the problem solving element the humorousness of of the world and at that point any decent sized video game studio is going to be like okay we're not doing that mm -hmm. it's, you've just told you've just described a game that's going to lose us 50 million dollars so no we're not like there's a niche of fans who would love it and, and love that kind of game but if you're talking about a game that that sells copies and, and makes back its money you're talking about something that's based on action and action means combat so i actually don't know and when i think about you know and i know for example there was a great um in the early like text-based video game era there was a great game based off the hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy and the whole joke was that it played with that format of of game where you would enter in text commands with a keyboard and then it would obviously be in that universe that didn't cooperate with you very well um so so i you know i, I would love to have something where you know these books always kind of break the fourth wall a little bit you know a game that does that um, but boy, anytime I've tried to play a game, they like the South Park games do that, you know, they kind of play with the format, but if you, you're on a level where you're failing the same task, hearing that the, them tell the joke 27 times in a row, mm -hmm. boy, the humor wears off real quick. <laughs> uh, that's a good point. So I don't know that, that, that is a great question. It's one that people have asked. And I think somewhere down in my contract, it's got how much I get paid if they do make a video game off, off the, the movie or the, the books. Or, Would or you even want to know what direction they end up going if you didn't have creative input? I don't you see. I don't know. Because if you did try to do like a role playing game, it's still got to be like a combat based thing. I don't know. It, it, it would have to be really clever. And the thing is, is that I would it would have to be so different from the books because i wouldn't want them you can't just adapt a book into a video game like it would have to be its own thing and it would have to be weird and funny and unusual for its own reasons like in a way that only a game can be you mm -hmm. see what i mean like i would almost even if it was a video game like saying making fun of the books for being bad that would be that would be better than to just try to like translate well here's how we'll do this scene and we'll put it in a game and as you the character it's like well you've got to try to escape the the meat monster or whatever and it's like well yeah but what you're supposed to feel in the book when that happens versus what you're going to feel when you've got a controller in your hand controlling it are two totally different things they're just two they're two totally different media gotcha well, Jason, thank you so much for being so generous with your time and taking the chance to meet with me. Um, do you have any last remarks or comments or promos that you want to leave us with? The book is called If This Book Exists, You're in the Wrong Universe. And if you're hearing about this series for the first time, you can start with that one if you feel like it. That would be the most expensive possible way to start because obviously it's a brand new hardcover uh audiobook but the other ones john dies at the end is the first one that made me a, a mildly famous writer you can find that anywhere is probably three bucks on kindle or you could get it at a used bookstore at a garage sale i don't know library um but you but you do not this is this is not me as an author saying if you want to enjoy the new book you have to first do three books worth of homework i would not ask you to do that i'm not going to ask you to go back and read four hundred thousand words to catch up to the new one it's not this that's not the type of series it is. You can just jump in on this one if you feel like it. Speculative Sandbox is a volunteer-run podcast that relies on the collaboration of fellow creators like you. Join the conversation and participate in fun polls and questionnaires on TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter. Interested in being in a future episode? Our DMs are open, or you can email speculativesandbox at gmail.com.